thank you for joining our e-seminar today entitled Orthopedic Focus on the Importance of Balance Assessment for Return to Play After ACL Reconstruction. About our speaker, Justin is the coordinator for sports medicine at ARIA 3B Orthopedics in Philadelphia and is part of the athletic training pool for the U.S. Soccer Federation. He has 19 years of experience as a physical therapist and athletic trainer and has worked with athletes of all levels including the NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB, MLS, WPS, MLL, ATP, and WTA. Justin was a member of the U.S. Men's National Soccer Team medical staff for the 2010 World Cup. He was previously the physical therapist for the athletic departments at St. Joseph's University, Temple University, and Villanova University. Justin was also previously the team physical therapist for the NFL charge of the WUSA and the Philadelphia Kicks of the NPSL. Besides soccer, he has extensive experience in treating professional athletes from other sports, including baseball, basketball, football, hockey, and tennis. His clients include World Cup finalists, Grand Slam champions, and Olympic medalists. I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Justin. And Justin, the presentation is yours. Thank you, Mary, for that introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'm going to try to cover a complicated topic in a short period of time and, and do our best to leave some time for uh, qu chat questions at the end. Uh, there we go. All right. So just a few definitions to get started. Um, I like to use these to sort of sum up what we're talking about and show what a complex uh, situation this is. Uh, balance. So as a noun, it's sort of a distribution of weight, and it enables us to stand upright and move without falling over. Uh, versus balance as a verb is our ability to maintain that position uh, without falling over. Uh, proprioception, we all know, is a, a sense of how our bodies are positioned. Uh, kinesthesia is a sense of movement, and I, and I sort of like to lump all that together under neuromuscular control, and that's sort of our ability to coordinate our muscular system uh, our motor system to allow us to maintain balance uh, with activities. So we all know the components, our vestibular system, our visual system, and our somatosensory system. And I apologize for the, uh, for the PowerPoint. Uh, it was done on um, uh, a Mac and transferring it over to PC today with some of our uh, techni uh, technical glitches like the somatosensory sort of mess it up. So I apologize if uh, some of the things are off the screen. So let's talk about first the uh, effects of ACL injury and reconstruction on, on balance and motor control. So what we see a lot of, we see that there's not only effects on the uh, operated leg, but also on the unoperated leg. Um, Roberts in the Journal of Orthopedic Residency showed that bilateral proprioceptive deficits uh, in the archives of physical medicine, we see that uh, reconstructed subjects show poor sensory and motor performance following ACL reconstruction. Uh, what we do see is reconstruction provides uh, mechanical restraint and does have an impact on proprioception, but it doesn't seem to get us back to where we are at pre-injury level. Um, we see that after ACL reconstruction that uh, ACL reconstruction rehab, I'm sorry, uh, rotation proprioceptive sense improves significantly. But once again, it doesn't get back to that baseline level, that pre-injury level. So what we see is that we have a loss of balance, proprioception, motor control. It does return and improve after reconstruction and rehabilitation, but it never improves to that pre-injury level. And what we're trying to figure out is can we do this through more detailed balance assessment and, and rehabilitation? Um, or are we left a deficit that predisposes athletes to uh, re-injury? How to assess balance. Uh, there's numerous ways. There's high-tech, low-tech ways. Some of the low-tech ways are the star excursion, uh, which we see sort of at the bottom, the middle picture with the uh, lines on the floor. 
There's a Y balance, which is next to that on the left. Uh, there's the BESS, which is the far right black and white picture. BESS is originally done for concussions, but some people are modifying it for lower extremity injuries. And then we have the high-tech systems, the uh, Biodex and the Norocom systems specifically. If we look at the research, let's start with STAR excursion. Um, we show that uh, that balance uh, training helps to improve the results of testing with SCAR, STAR excursion. So the first test uh, by Levy showed that glute med strengthening and balance exercises showed the greatest improvement in balance scores on the STAR excursion test. Uh, Harrington showed that uninjured leg shows deficits that controlled. And this sort of goes back to what we mentioned already, that we see these deficits not only in the surgical leg, but the uh, non-operated leg as well. Mullen in the Journal of Athletic Training showed that postural control and quality of movement were affected negatively after glute med fatiguing exercises. And I think this is important because what we see in athletics is that um, we get people better uh, in the clinic and in the training room, and they do well on testing. But what's hard to measure is their ability to uh, maintain that over a course of a game, whether it's a 90-minute soccer match or a basketball game. And as they fatigue, there's sort of been this thought process that we're at higher risk for injury. And this study sort of helps to prove that, that we do show some decrease in postural control movement after a fatiguing exercise. Uh, lastly, we see in the Journal of Athletic Training that uh, almost three years after ACL reconstruction, we still see some postural uh, deficits with the STAR excursion testing. Some other studies uh, related to STAR excursion we see in uh, female soccer players. Um, they showed improved scores on the STAR test and uh, neuromuscular uh, testing focusing on core stability and lower extremity strength. So the previous testing showed glute med uh, strengthening improved balance scores and fatiguing decreased these scores. Here we see a general lower extremity strengthening program with core improved scores. Uh, at return to sport, ACL patients demonstrated uh, reduced anterior reach uh, in both limbs compared to controls and uh, a modified star excursion balance test associated with leg strength. So what we're seeing is that once again, um, these patients show deficits not only in the surgical leg, but the non-operated leg, and uh, reach distance is associated with strength. So the previous studies, uh, this is correlating their findings that improvements are seen with glute med strengthening and with general low extremity strengthening. And I think this is the last uh, research study for the STAR excursion. Um, they found in uh, the Journal of Sports Physical Therapy that hip strength but not core endurance was related to the scores in female collegiate athletes. So once again, some of these tests are contradictory where one shows that the core affects it where the other one doesn't. But I think overall what we're seeing from all this is that any rehabilitation focusing on uh, lower extremity and core strength and balance exercises, we're going to see an improvement in the scar extursion balance tests. Oh, I apologize. Two more uh, research studies on the SCAR, STAR excursion test. Um, eyes closed training can improve balance in dancers, according to um, Hutt. And I think we can see this overall in, in athletes and patients in general, that many of these patients are visually dependent. And if we perform either eyes closed or balance training where they're sort of distracted and having to track an object or, or catch an object, that we can see improved scores uh, on balance testing. Lastly, they, in Strength and Conditioning uh, Journal, we saw that plyometric training improved these STAR excursion test results in, uh, fem in male basketball players compared to controls. And uh, I think, once again, what we're seeing is any kind of lower extremity training that incorporates strength and balance and proprioception and neuromuscular control, we're going to see an improvement in overall balance scores. So the Y balance is sort of a progression of that star balance test. So they sort of uh, simplified the test. Instead of having all those multiple direction reaches, they had uh, the anterior and then sort of the posterior diagonal reaches. And what we're seeing in some of those testing is that uh, it may not be specific enough to pick up deficits that are lingering that we saw in the STAR excursion and that we'll see in some of the Biodex and Norcom testing. So this Meyer uh, paper showed that there was no difference on Y-balance scores between 
athletes who are cleared and not re cleared for return to sports. So um, either the test isn't isn't detailed enough, isn't specific enough, or in their group, they um, balance just wasn't a component of their deficits when returning to sports. Uh, the next research paper showed that hip strengthening may be beneficial in the first three months after ACL reconstruction. Um, you know, I think what we're seeing is in the first three months we see significant deficits of all lower extremity strength tests, and it may be sort of imperative to improve that glute med strengthening uh, early on to improve gait, improve balance, improve single leg stance activities. Uh, in a pediatric orthopedic journal, uh, they show adolescent patients do not reliably obtain movement patterns and dynamic balance to permit a safe return to sports nine months after ACL reconstruction. Um, there may be a difference in these younger patients compared to adults with the Y-balance testing scores. Um, once again, I think it's not an end-all uh, for a time frame. Um, I think it's more about when patients testing scores return to normal uh, both side-to-side -side symmetry and also looking at controls. So, uh, but once again, I think this reinforces the, the time frame that I like to emphasize that, that a lot of surgeons say six months for return to sports, and I, I think most patients are not meeting their objective criteria for return to sports at six months, and it's definitely closer to nine or 12, and this, this sort of backs it up with these adolescent patients. We look at the best, really only one study looking at balance non-concussion related, and it, it compares it to the STAR excursion balance test, and it showed that female basketball players display inferior static balance to gymnasts um, and inferior dynamic balance to soccer players. So for me, what this test really shows is that each, each athlete and, and the requirements for their sports are different, and we can't necessarily always use the same test for each individual, and the scoring criteria might need to be different too. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're returning players to sports that, you know, we need to look at each individual and each sport and sometimes each position and level of play differently when we're testing them. We may have more stringent criteria for some sports uh, for specific testings. Yeah. Now we're going to get into sort of the high tech, uh, the computer assessed balance test. Uh, the first one is the Biodex. We're going to look at some of the research from there. Um, the first study showed in motor control that there's a tendency for soccer players to be better at balance on their non-dominant leg. And I see this a lot with my experience in soccer, that that plant leg, uh, the non-dominant leg is their plant leg. And it has to be able to maintain balance while they're doing a dynamic activity with the kicking leg. So a lot of times we see improved balance and improved eccentric and general control, neuromuscular control on that plant leg, that non-dominant leg in soccer players. So just another thing to, to take into control um, when we're testing these patients is that we may want higher scores on their non-dominant, their plant leg, uh, and not just symmetry. Uh, the next study by Paterno shows that uh, in hip rotation movement, uh, frontal plane knee range of motion during landing and asymmetries in sagittal plane knee movements and initial contact and postural stability are all collectively a strong predictor of second ACL injuries after reconstruction. And there's a lot of big words in there, but for me what that shows is that when we see deficits in balance and neuromuscular control or we see asymmetry, those athletes are probably at a higher risk for re-tear after ACL surgery. So once again, I think we really need to normalize their balance. Um, if we have pre-injury data, then that's great. Then we know what the leg was before. If we don't, then we're looking at symmetry and sometimes maybe in a soccer player looking at um, improving greater than the, uh, for the non-dominant leg. But once again, we really want to look at testing and, and looking at asymmetry for these patients. Uh, the next study by Reamer showed that uh, recreational college students, neither hip or ankle fatiguing program impaired single leg stance, postural control more than the other. But both of them showed that either fatiguing the hip or fatiguing the ankle showed a decrease in balance. So um, for me what that says is it's not necessarily the hip or the ankle or the knee, it's the lower extremity. If we see fatigue, then we're going to show decrease in balance scores. So um, I think that puts in the back of our head that we need to improve endurance and we need to look at the sports and how much endurance does that player need and how long are they going to be playing um, before we return them to sport. 
some other biodex studies. Uh, a six weeks neuromuscular training and ACL prevention program improved uh, total on anterior posterior limb balance in high school athletes, uh, female athletes. So once again, I think we can see improvement pretty quickly with some of these rehabilitation programs aimed at improving balance and neuromuscular control. Um, in female lacrosse players, we see that shot accuracy may be related to uh, greater liberal levels of visual search and balance ability. So again, I think balance not only improves our return to sport, our injury prevention, but also can improve performance um, in our athletes. Now onto the Norcom, uh, which is what I have most of my experience with. Um, it shows that visual symptoms was the predominant sensory system used, and, and I would agree with our testing protocols using the Norcom that we use and some of our unpublished data. Um, that the visual system is, is used predominantly by most athletes. Um, we've had testing of uh, general sports teams at university settings, and what we see is even in non-injured athletes that they're visually dominant, and we take that away, they have problems with balance. So I think it just sort of reinforces that we need to test and tax the other systems when we're looking at um, rehabilitation and return to sports for athletes. Now the next test showed two years after surgery, single, single limb postural stability in the reconstructed groups differed significantly from controls. Uh, once again, this reinforces the uh, previous studies that we've, we saw from the BAS and the star balance excursion and the Y balance that we still see prolonged deficits in neuromuscular control and balance in these surgical patients. Uh, the next study talks about preseason balance measures. Uh, postural sway specifically as a predictor of ankle sprains in high school basketball players. So um, what it's showing is that when you have postural sway that you have a larger sort of base of support and, and you're not able to uh, maintain that smaller base of support as well with your balance. And those patients showed an increased rate of ankle sprains in this study. Um, Holly Silvers just spoke at a, our sports medicine conference last week and she's looking at return to sport after ACL reconstruction in professional soccer players. And she describes this sort of phenomenon as a cone and that as, as that cone grows larger, there's greater variation in the athlete's ability to maintain their balance and they're seeing increased risk of injury um, with that pos increased postural sway. So we want to improve their ability to maintain that postural sway to have a sort of smaller, narrow base of support that they're able to control um, and that hopefully will reduce injury for as this study showed, ankle sprains, but in ACLs as we're talking about today. Some other Neurocom tests, uh, balance testing battery, um, and this is from our research testing, uh, unpublished data that I'm still working on. We looked at the modified CTSIB, which is sort of an eyes open, eyes closed, stable, unstable surface. Uh, US, which is uh, unilateral stance, single leg stance, eyes open, eyes closed and limits the stability where the athletes have to move their, their um, base of support outside, or their body weight outside their base of support and, and hit targets on a screen. Uh, what it showed, it wasn't predictive of ACL injury. However, the testing did show some prolonged deficits in our ACL reconstructed patients. Um, some of these are at two and three years and returned to sports already and still showed some deficits with the testing. Um, and these were patients who were not reconstructed by us and did not do rehab with us. They were testing at colleges um, where we were sort of looking at teams as a whole. So what we're finding is these players uh, were cleared to return to sports, but once again showing deficits, uh, prolonged deficits two and three years out after ACL reconstruction. Uh, some more unpublished data from our studies showed the return to sport testing battery is able to detect limb asymmetry following surgery. So what we're seeing is um, Immediately after surgery, we're seeing deficits, and these deficits are improved with rehab, and we can address them and, and correct symmetry, but once again, these can take prolonged periods of time. Um, with the testing equipment, we're able to test frequently during rehabilitation, and, and I feel we're able to address these balance deficits earlier um, than maybe some of these other studies are showing. Um, but once again, these can be prolonged deficits, nine months, a year, year and a half before we correct them. And our feeling is that if, if we're seeing these deficits, these players aren't ready to return to their sport. Let's talk about general return to sport testing. Um, current research supports testing to assess for limb symmetry. And, and there's a debate, is limb symmetry good enough? But I think most of the time that's all we have because 
very few high school athletes, even a lot of college athletes, don't have a lot of pre-injury testing data that we can compare to, whether that's balance, strength, uh, hop testing, on the field testing, um, fitness testing. So a lot of this we have to do our best and assume that limb symmetry is what we're shooting for. Um, we like to look at both clinic-based and field-based testing. Um, some of the big debate is what percent dif dif deficit is, is acceptable. So that percent difference side to side, um, some of the research shows 15%. For us, we like our athletes to be under 10. Some people will even say that really there shouldn't be any deficit side to side. Um, and we'll talk about that as we progress through the slides. And then one of the sort of topics now that Kevin Wilk has, has I think had an article, uh, sort of an opinion article in the JOSPT journal, was limb symmetry versus ACL prevention. Um, so when you're looking at some of these things in the hop test, they might be symmetrical with their measurements, but they don't look good in landing. And at what point do we clear athletes that sort of have bad landing mechanics, but they're symmetrical, or do we need to continue to focus on rehab and sort of ACL prevention and improve those mechanics before we let them return. And I think that's a, a sort of a hot topic right now. Um, when we look at return to sport, we, I like to do some type of um, um, outcome measure, some self-reporting questionnaires. Um, and we look at IKDC, low scores. Uh, we're reasonably indicative of failure on a return to sport testing battery, and I think that's pretty obvious. If those patients aren't scoring, you know, within a point or two of being perfect on there, then they're not going to pass their hop testing. They're not going to pass their field testing. But, you know, I think it's a simple way. If we score that first, we can know whether we want to waste our time testing or if we need to continue rehab and put that testing off a little longer. Um, another research study uh, by Moeller showed that single leg or single hop for distance and uh, ACL RSI were found to be the strongest predictive parameters of return to sport. So, um, what we're seeing again is that uh, that return to sport um, questionnaire is important. So, um, not only is it the objective testing, but the patient's subjective report. If they're not confident and their their scores are low, then those patients aren't aren't going to return to sport um, effectively. So this is what our talk is primarily about today, balance. And a couple questions. What you, what's, what's best to use? Is limb symmetry, is that the end-all, be-all, static versus dynamic testing? Is testing sensitive enough? And is passing by uh, the system criteria enough? So here's some printouts from the uh, Norcom testing. This is a weight-bearing squat that we like to use. Um, and what we see with that is that um, we can see asymmetry just in a static squat. So when we test those patients, we have them stand at, at full extension at zero degree, or 30 degrees of flexion, 60 degrees of flexion, 90 degrees of flexion. Uh, what you see on this test, it, on the results, is that the green means it's with, within 10%. Um, and we see that or within, a, within the, I take that back, within the system's uh, acceptable margin of error. Uh, what we see when the red is that it's outside that margin. So if it's in the white and it's green, then we're good. If it's in the red and it's those bars are in the gray, then, then that's unacceptable according to the system. Um, and what we see with testing is the patients tend to uh, favor their uninjured side and put more weight on it and less weight on their surgical side, and that's where we see these deficits from. What we don't know for sure is that there might be acceptable ranges for the computer, what it's giving us in the green, um, but is that still enough to know that that athlete's safe to return to sport? So um, if we look at the 60 degrees, there's, there's still a variability here. So one's almost a 60, one's just barely above 40, so it's probably between 10 and 15% deficit side to side. Is that acceptable or is that unacceptable? And I, I don't think we know that yet. The next test that I like to use is the um, single leg stance. And we do it eyes open, eyes closed. It looks at postural sway. And um, what we can get is a side to side difference. So if we look at the first one with eyes, uh, it says eyes open, we see a 14% side to side difference. Um, 
for me that makes me nervous a little bit. I want that under 10. The second one with eyes closed, they did terribly on both sides. Uh, they're both in the red. They're both not within the normative data, even though it's the same side to side. Uh, so there's symmetry, but it's bad symmetry. So we know with this patient, they're probably visually dominant, and we didn't work enough on eyes closed to correct that visual dominance. Um, usually what we see is it's uh, we're not symmetrical visually dominant, that after ACL reconstruction, one side is going to be worse than the other with balance. Usually not quite as um, bad with eyes open when we do eyes closed and we see a big deficit there. And last one is limits of stability. What we see with limits of stability, you see this sort of center area with a lot of black and then we see these squiggly lines and these blue circles all around. So those are the targets that patients have to hit. And they have to lean their body weight, shift their body weight outside their base of support. So they have to go forward, they have to do diagonals forward, they have to do lateral, they have to do sort of diagonals lateral and backwards. And what we tend to see is that they tend to favor their non-surgical leg. Their, their movement patterns are better. So what the test looks at, it looks at reaction time. So how quickly from the the go from the, the equipment to when they first move, uh, that's a reaction time. We look at movement velocity, how fast they move from that center target out to the targets they're trying to hit. We look at endpoint, so trying to get into that box, that far box, and the excursion, how far they go, and then directional control when they get there. Do they hold that pretty steady or are they all over the map? And you can see on these, the tracking from those lines, they're sort of all over the map with that testing. We want that a little more precise with directional control. We want the end point and how far they move to be pretty symmetrical. We want movement velocity to be pretty symmetrical. And then we want it to be within the normative data, too. So if they're symmetrical but they're not within normative data for their age and, and, and weight and height, then we know we need to work on some of this as well. Next part of testing is strength. Um, so for us, for our return, our clinic-based return to sport criteria, it's balance, strength, and hop testing. Uh, we talked about balance for strength. There's all kinds of ways to test it, isokinetic, isotonic, power, endurance. Uh, most clinics do not have isokinetic units, so we came up with an isotonic strength testing uh, protocol that we're in the midst of uh, verifying through research. Um, so we do sort of a progressive one rep max for uh, quads and hamstrings on knee extension and, and knee flexion machines. And then we'll take a percentage of that and do reps to fatigue. So we're looking at sort of power and endurance. Um, some of the research shows, here we see with Angelosi that uh, despite near recovery of uh, maximal volitional contractions, that's when you look at EMGs and you look to see if they're side to side, if they're putting the same uh, EMG output with uh, isometric knee extension. Um, even though it's recovered in near pre-injury levels, we still see deficits at uh, the force production at six months. Um, and that improves. It's closer to 12 months where we see that. So they, can, they don't produce the rate of force production as quickly. So they might, at the end point, may able to be able to produce the same force, but they produce it slower. And that's important. We need, we need them to be able to produce um, strength in their, their quads and hamstrings at a rapid pace for these eccentric activities required by sports. Uh, the next one by Schmidt shows that uh, quadricep deficits greater than 50% negatively affect function and performance. Uh, patients with more symmetrical um, uh, strength, where they say less than 10% demonstrate functional performance similar to the uninjured side. So um, that's why I don't like the 15% side-to-side uh, -side deficit. I like my patients to be within 10% or less, I feel like. And even that, I probably would like them to be closer to 5% or zero. Um, the better we can get with symmetry, the more confident we feel that their strength is returned to those pre-injury levels. And I think that's important. If you don't have strength, then you're not going to do well in balance. You're not going to do well in your hop testing. You're not going to do well on the field. Um, some more studies this in uh, AJSM showed that patients with lower quadriceps strength displayed greater movement asymmetries in the sagittal plane. Uh, and quadricep strength is related to movement asymmetries and functional performance. So, and I think it goes beyond just quads. If we see strength deficits in hamstrings and in the glutes and gastroc, we're going to see deficits in balance, neuromuscular control, and performance. But as we all know from ACL reconstruction, the quads are sort of the, the hardest to get back, the last to get back. So most of the studies look at quadricep asymmetries uh, when looking at strength. And, 
but I, I think we can see this at any lower extremity uh, muscle group. So functional testing, there's a lot of functional testing out there. I think the HOP test has sort of the most research behind it and a little more valid, not saying it's better, but just more research on it. Um, the first test on the slide shows the uh, FLEA, which is the functional lower extremity evaluation, sort of a new test out there. Um, the next one is a landing error, score, landing error scoring system. Um, and that's a, that's a sort of a drop jump test and looking at um, different criteria, looking at limb alignment, uh, eccentric control, those type of things. And you can find that online. And it's sort of a visual scoring system. And it's pretty easy to do. Uh, and it's just another functional test that we can do with our athletes. I feel the more tests we can put our athletes through, the more that they show symmetry and positive results, uh, the more confident I am to return them the activity. And the more tests we do and we find some bad results, some asymmetry, then it, it gives me confidence that I need to hold them back and, and continue with rehab a little longer. Um, those testing results, too, for me also help to validate uh, continued rehab for insurance purposes, too. So if we do some of these functional tests and they show deficits, it, I think it's easier to justify continued uh, physical therapy visits, too. Um, so let's talk about hot testing battery. Uh, what some of the research shows. So the HOP tests provide a reliable and valid performance-based outcome measure. Uh, this is according to Reed in the Journal of Physical Therapy. Um, it suggests that functional testing should be performed both under non-fatigued and fatigued test conditions. Uh, and this is Augustine. And, and this is an interesting study. So they took uh, single leg hop for distance. And they had the patients perform the test. Then they put them on a, on a seated knee extension machine and do as many reps as they could until they fatigued and then immediately retest them. And what that showed is the patients who might have passed on that single leg hop in the non-fatigued state showed deficits in the fatigued state. Um, with our testing, our return to sport testing, we usually do the strength test and then follow it up immediately after with the hop testing. So we're testing pretty much all of our athletes in that fatigued state, which I think is important because, uh, once again, they might do well in the first 15 minutes of a game or a match, but as they start to fatigue, we might see these continued deficits in balance um, and neuromuscular control, which is going to put our athletes at risk for re-injury or injuring another body part, spraining an ankle, you know, falling, breaking a wrist, whatever that might be. Uh, drop them. Drop jump testing, that's a mouthful to say, drop jump testing. I, I recently added this in um, to our testing battery. So in the past, we didn't do it. We did the balance, we did the strength, we did the hop testing. And I cleared a lot of patients, which looking back, if I would have done this drop jump testing and looked at it in video slow motion analysis, I don't know if I would have passed all those athletes. Um, there's a lot of research to validate uh, the drop jump testing. And what I put on here, video analysis, there's a bunch of free apps. Ubersense, which I just got an email, they're changing their name, and I forget what they're changing it to. But Ubersense is a free app for an iPad or iPhone, and I think they have an Android as well. And what it does is allow you to videotape athletes doing any sport, and you can slow it down, and you can um, sort of do it frame by frame. You can do it sort of at quarter speed. You can draw angles on it. You can email it to people. So it's a great app to, and a great tool to be able to look at these things. So if we look at the drop jump, start on a the box, they jump down, they land, um, and then they jump back up like they're going up for a rebound in basketball, and then they land again. And what, what we're looking for is asymmetry. So if you look at the bottom one, um, sort of frame four, look at the valgus moment that that female athlete goes into, and probably even a little more on the left than the right. So this is a great tool and a free tool to really look at slow motion analysis and a lot of these things. We can even videotape the hop testing if we want to and look at some of the landing mechanics. But it lets us see things that we're not going to be able to see with the naked eye. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Mary just sent me a uh, chat asking about if we looked at fatigued versus non-fatigued state with the balance testing uh, with the weight-bearing squat and the Norocom. Um, and actually, I have not, but that's actually uh, it's a great idea. Um, we tend to do our testing battery. If it's a patient who has not done rehab with us, they've done worked with the surgeon I work with, he did their surgery, they done rehab somewhere else, they come in and we start the testing battery. So do the balance, do the strength testing, and then we do the hop testing. Um, so they're doing the balance testing in an unfatigued state. When they're patient that I'm doing their rehab with, then I'll sort of test them when I think their balance is ready to be tested. 
and I'll test them when I think their strengths are ready to be tested, and I'll test them when I think their hop tests are ready to be tested. So Mary brought up a good point. Um, even with balance testing, maybe we should be assessing these athletes and these patients in a fatigue state as well to see if there's any difference that we don't see in the non-fatigue state. Uh, next is on-the-field testing. This is probably the hardest thing because most athletes, one, don't have any pre-testing data on this if they have some other things. Um, two, it's hard to do in a PT clinic or an athletic training room. You've got to get them out in the field. And three, it's not really looking at symmetry because when you're doing these activities, you're really looking at, at function of both limbs when we do it. So let's talk about some of the drills. So there's a T drill, which is the first picture we see on the left where there's three cones. So they sort of sprint forward, they touch a cone, they sprint to the left, they sprint back to the right, and then they sprint back to the starting point. Um, you can do that in different ways. So you can have them sprint, side shuffle, back pedal. Um, you can have them side shuffle, sprint forward, back pedal, sprint forward. So there's a bunch of different ways you can do the T drill. Um, with that, it's hard to look and assess limb symmetry, but we can see um, abnormal movement patterns, and we could even use the UberSense to um, sort of break it down in slow motion analysis. The next one in the middle picture is a pro agility drill, which is the uh, from the NFL Combine. So they start in the middle one, they sprint to the left first, I believe, then they sprint to the whole way to the right, and then back to that starting time, and they time it. Um, and there's a little bit of normative data on times for different football players for positions. Um, but once again, we're not able to really truly objectively assess limb symmetry versus looking at movement patterns. Um, another test is the Illinois Agility Test that's on the right, and you can Google all these and, and uh, find out how to specifically do the test. But once again, there's not a sort of side-to-side -side limb symmetry assessment, but just movement patterns overall. Uh, if we look at research from Meyer in the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy, there's um, said while unilateral deficits are present following uh, ACL reconstruction, they may not be evident during these bipedal performance or during modified versions of the double limb performance activities. And he specifically is talking about NFL combine testing. But any of these on-the-field agility testing, it's really hard to separate surgical, non-surgical limb. We're really just looking at movement patterns. Um, and some of these may not be um, difficult enough or specific enough to pick up deficits. Um, maybe we can see those deficits with the slow motion analysis that we wouldn't see. Um, but you know, it, once again, we're not going to be able to get that uh, percent deficit side to side. Uh, fitness testing, this is a big thing for me. I always hope that my athletes have some kind of baseline fitness testing that I can test them with. Um, just another measure of endurance. And if I if I see that their BEEP scores are significantly lower than they were pre-injury, then that means that we need to continue to work on fitness before we let them play in a match or, or play in a game because, once again, the concern about fatigue and, and decreased balance and neuromuscular control and risk of re-injury is, is too significant for me to let someone return if they're not quite back to their uh, pre-injury level of fitness. Um, so here we're going to talk about return to sport battery, and we talked about this a little bit. Um, here, Reinman talks about that the performance of a static balance tasks are mild to moderately related. They appear to be unrelated to functional reaching or hopping movements, uh, supporting the use of a battery of tests to determine overall postural control and performance. And I agree with this 100% that we can't take any one of these tests out of isolation, whether it's balance, whether it's strength, whether it's uh, functional testing, and within those, whether it's static or dynamic balance. I think we need to assess all of these as a battery and sort of put it together as a big picture. Um, another study by Harris in orthopedics did a sy systematic review, showed that fewer than 50% of the studies using objective criteria to permit return to sport. So we see this all the time. Um, uh, surgeons put out studies on ACL reconstruction, and there's really no good objective criteria that they're using to assess how one players are ready to return. A lot of them just pick six months as an arbitrary time frame, and I think that's the worst thing you can possibly do. Um, we tell our athletes that we really have no idea when they're going to be ready to play, and it's probably going to be, it can be anywhere from three months to 18 months, and most of them are probably going to fall between that nine and 12 month time frame. But for us, it's not a time frame, it's about meeting those objective criteria. Uh, some more studies on the testing battery show that young reconstructed patients uh, assessed after return clearance from their surgeon demonstrated measurable functional deficits. 
um, and they show that these are independent of time from surgery. And that persistent side-to-side -side asymmetries may increase the risk of contralateral or ipsilateral injury. And this is from Meyer from uh, Children's Cincinnati. They do a lot um, in this adolescent population. And, and I think this hits the nail on the head that um, we can't just send people back based on a time frame from surgery because they're still going to show deficits. And if they have these deficits, they're at an increase of risk for injury. Next study, uh, Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy showed six to nine months following reconstruction, patients show functional hop and isokinetic uh, knee extension deficits as well as kinematic differences during hop tests. Once again, six months is pretty early. Nine months, we're getting there. Some of these athletes take 12 months, you know, 16 to 18 months. So it does take quite a while to really get this symmetry back. Um, here, another study showed that most patients aren't ready for return to sports at eight months. Um, once again, just showing that there's the time frame doesn't really matter. Uh, another one from uh, the group in Cincinnati, um, they developed a pretty good algorithm um, as potential to identify post-surgical deficits, address them through the systematic progression through return to sports stages of return to sport play and rehabilitation. Um, this is Meyer. It's a journal of orthopedic sports physical therapy. And um, the... Um, References are all at the end, so you can look it up. But they have a pretty good, thorough sort of return to sport progression in their rehab. The problem with some of it is it uses some slow motion capture. Uh, I think they use a little bit of 3D kinematics when they test patients. So not completely applicable to most uh, PT clinics or athletic training rooms. But I think you can sort of take what they do and make it a little more simplified and, and still get some good objective testing for our athletes. Um, so let's sum this up a little bit. Uh, what we're seeing is there's no single test predictive or safe return to sport after ACL reconstruction. So uh, no specific balance test, no specific strength test, hop test. I think we have to look at them all as a battery. Um, a lot of people don't want to do a lot of testing. They want to simplify it. But for me, the more testing I can do, the more things I can either show that they, they show symmetry and they pass, or they still show deficits or asymmetry and reasons to hold them back. Um, I think we need to look at a combination of things. I think we need to look at balance, strength, hop, on-the-field testing, and fitness. And I think those five things we need to put together and look at the picture and see if those athletes are ready. Um, when we look at limb symmetry, what percent difference is acceptable? And, and I don't know if we have the answer. I don't think 15% is acceptable. I like 10 and under, but that still may be too much of a, a deficit in some patients that may predispose them to re-injury or contralateral injury. And then lastly, uh, what about these patients who have symmetrical deficits? What do we do? So those, those athletes who pass all the testing, but when they do the drop jump or they do their hop testing, they, they show a lot of valgus knee moment. They show sort of um, abnormal landing mechanics and eccentric control with the hop testing or the drop jump, um, but it's symmetrical. What do we do? How long do we keep them out to try to adjust those um, and correct them? Or are they even correctable, and that's that patient, and they're just at high risk for re-injury? And, and I don't know if we have the answer for that yet. Um, hopefully, over the next few years, we'll start seeing some research studies that show um, with these symmetrical deficits, how long do we keep them out and keep working on it um, before they're corrected, or at what point do we know that they're just not going to be corrected and those patients are at risk, and then maybe we counsel them not to return to those higher-risk sports. So that gave us about 15 minutes for questions. I see um, I have one in the chat. Um, 